Oh hell internet, a double barrel of videos here because I've got stuff to do and I just need to get some crap out of here. So if you have strong feelings on either side of trans issues then this video may be triggering for you. But stick around, I'd like you to hear it please. I've tried to edit it as little as possible so it remains genuine. But forgive me if I misspeak or if it's not well structured. I'm not trying to dehumanize anyone at all. I do have a point though, although predictably for me, it's somewhere in the gray area. However, I want to say at the outset, don't be violent or abusive to strangers, ever, even if they look strange to you. And it's essential to remember that a minority group, by definition, looks strange to more people. But that fear response is irrational, as we shall see. With that said, there are two stories this week which made me reflect again on identity issues. And yes, I have opinions about identity, and you can read into that as much as you might like. I do think that cis people have a right to talk about these things. Uh, we are all one spectrum, we are all one. And I will hold off on personal details, but in fact, although I am a de facto straight white male, I'm not a de jure straight white male, which is a fancy way of saying it's complicated. And that is the whole point. Precisely zero humans are in exactly the same place as each other on all axes relating to gender and sexuality. Zero. During Pride Month, I saw a meme that wished happy pride to those who don't like labels. And I thought, thank you. But I go one step further, and I could be wrong here. I think labels are actively harmful and becoming more so. And in this video, I will talk about why. Let's look at those two stories. The first one, Dave Chappelle was cancelled again, this time for transphobia. Actually, of course, he's not cancelled. He will be just fine, but he caused a controversy. The core of the issue, to oversimplify, seems to be the opinion that gender is fact enables violence. And I'm sorry, but that's a non sequitur. It can't be that simple. Also, I'm not sure that everyone means the same thing by the word gender in this situation. Now, of course, I do get the argument. Jokes like this enable a culture in which people feel empowered to openly question trans identities. Okay, that makes sense. But would any of those people, if asked directly, really say that Dave Chappelle is the person who they should be taking their social and moral cues from? Hell, Dave Chappelle himself wouldn't say that. And would any of those people, if asked directly, say that yes, those jokes in themselves make it okay for a person to be abusive or violent to a stranger? I somehow doubt it. People who act this way are not acting out of some response to Dave Chappelle's work, they're acting out of an amygdala-based fear response, and that is what needs to be addressed. Side note, but I think every human being should watch this lecture by Robert Sapolsky about human behavior. But there is just a general ingrained biological tendency for humans to morally judge people who live differently from us. Of course, trans people do not live differently from anyone because trans people are just people like any other people, which is why they should have all the same rights as all other people, and any attacks on them should be taken seriously as an attack on a person. We can equally substitute though, for example, the word evangelical people do not live differently from anyone because evangelical people are just people. The issues come, of course, in the power imbalance. Trans people are such a small percentage of the population, and when people feel their back is against the wall, they band together and look for allies. I'll be quite honest, I am not interested in being an ally to either side because this cannot be a war. But of course minorities do feel under siege, and we should remember that because no matter what the alarmists think, trans people are a small percentage of the population, like 1 or 2 percent, and there is no indication that this is growing rapidly. Although that may change, but I can say it with some certainty because I live in Thailand, which has more or less accepted trans people in everyday contexts, and based on my personal experience, yeah, 1 or 2 percent seems about right. The second story from this week is, apparently Superman is bisexual now. That's what I hear anyway. I am comics adjacent, I've never read them, but I am part of nerd culture, so I have some familiarity. As I understand it, we're talking about John Clark, Superman's son, who some regard as the new Superman. He kissed a boy, apparently. You can probably tell I have no real stake in this, but I think it's interesting because it kind of crosses the divide in the whole debate. Let me ask you, 
How do you know Superman wasn't always bisexual? All you've ever seen is brief excerpts from his dubiously continuous life in multiple universes. Now I'm sure that comic geeks out there can find lines which seem to confirm Superman's sexuality, but they don't. People misrepresent their own opinions all the time for any number of reasons, and I'm prepared to bet there has never been a DC comic titled Superman Reflects on the Nature of the Self, so the question remains. The point is that we assign qualities to our heroes without good reason, and yes, they are our heroes. These are modern myths, and we use them to indicate the way we want to think of ourselves. And this shows why strong feelings come out of it, because real, genuine, bona fide, spiritual attachments are being affected. And this is true of those on both sides, and I will give an example of each, although it will be dealt with in a very simplistic way. For my first example, wow, the new Star Wars trilogy caught some shit, didn't it? For my part, it was fine, but not transcendent, and I agree with many of the criticisms that many have made. The original Star Wars trilogy, though, was transcendent. I saw it at about the right age, age 10, and it definitely struck me. Now, I never went on to be part of that religion, and I use the word unironically there, but I saw how complete and inspiring a story it was. They were, of course, taken from a certain time in history, and that is why the sequels did merit some updating. And on paper, it was almost all there. Finn and Rey are great characters to introduce and to give their own stories to. Now, the story itself was a little underwhelming, but I don't think the faithful would have minded Finn and Rey being the heroes of a new age. It's just that the transition was so badly bungled. There's a famous clip of Kathleen Kennedy talking to George Lucas and saying that the important thing was to protect the characters that he had created. And that is exactly what they didn't do, to an almost comical degree. I won't go into it all here, but all three leads from the original trilogy were just plot devices for the sequel trilogy. There was almost no sense of their stories over the intervening years, and where there was, it was completely at odds from everything we knew about them. And then they all died, mostly purposeless deaths. It was laughable. For my second example, I turn to Harry Potter, which seems to have become another social creed in a similar way. I was too late for this one, I never read the originals, and I cannot really judge, although I am endlessly amused by ideas like Harry Potter was just a privileged white boy and Hermione did most of the work. The movie series was not transcendent for me, probably because of its bloated size, but the nature of the fan base shows that for many, it was. And one of the key themes which seemed to resonate with people was the sense of value it gave to outsiders and people who feel different. I can't say I fully get it, but that's just me. For other people, the whole experience was soured when J.K. Rowling became an outspoken member of the TERF position. Now, for me, the death of the author is a thing, so honestly I think those stories can mean the same to you now as they always did. But that's easy for me to say. Regardless, the reaction of some to this perceived betrayal is proof of the strength of feeling that lay beneath it. So I've treated these examples slightly differently because of meta-reasons surrounding corporate franchising and authorial intent. Honestly, I don't fully know where I stand on the nature of fiction as a social creed, but here we are. The point is that people associate with outside things as part of their own life stories, and they intimately weave those things into their own identities. Their positions on life, the universe, and everything are deeply personal and fixed forever. If you're older than 25 and you are flexible in your deepest convictions, then I can confirm that pretty much makes you a weirdo to your peers. I think that should change, but that's a different point. But it is related to this inflexibility that I must note something that I think is actually happening. The existence of the pride movement is changing the meaning of some words, most notably here, man and woman. I have no stake in this, language is descriptive. What words become in time is what they mean, but they also do need to perform a function, and there's more to say there. Saying men are men and women are women is a prescriptive definition, and a circular one at that. But, linguistically, saying trans women are women does kind of do the same thing. 
And prescriptive definitions are how religions work, and some religions have become attached to the meaning of words like man or woman. And this is not just a Western thing here. There are some social and sexual taboos surrounding gender all over the world. And this is not me saying, and that's how it is. There are historical examples of different models. The descriptive nature of language means that the meaning of these words should change in response to understanding we now have about the human condition. But let us also acknowledge this understanding has come to us only in the last few decades. So anyone who has grown up and formed ideas around a creed will have to experience real trauma from having that creed challenged. And that explains the level of defensiveness that remains. And it also explains why the LGBT movement can be characterized as an invasive agenda, even though it isn't one. For thousands of years, we lived in communities that actively came together around monolithic concepts. That is how we are built to form societies. And any label-having group is still, in some sense, beholden to this idea, or at very least will be seen this way from the outside. In the modern mass society, that has changed. And that change is inevitable, natural, and cannot be undone. One day soon, or perhaps already, the majority of people will have grown up in an ideological tumult that prevents the formation of any strong social identity. The problem is, we have not yet developed a strong association to a true human identity. And, in my humble opinion, labels will not help us to do so. Throughout this piece, I've tried to speak from outside, and not because I consider myself above the fray. I guess it kind of is, because in a way I want to try and get outside of both bubbles, but I will probably fail in that fully. And anyway, I'm not saying I'm a perfect actor. I'm just asking if this is a relevant perspective that allows us to see suffering that must occur on both sides of every social divide. My conclusion is this, any strongly held identity or label will tap into our religious thought patterns and lead us to treating people outside that bubble with some level of contempt. I do see the value of an identity in assigning meaning to our own lives, but the question is where to draw the line. And as I said at the outset, minorities are easy to identify as being the strange ones. So in this new modern context, we should always err on the side of accepting strangeness. Because, as the Christians say, there but for the grace of infinitely fluctuating space-time go the aggregate functions that precede this semantic phenomenon. That's what they say, right?